This is a bluebird. This is a blackbird. And of course, this is the Japanese long-tailed tit. If you look at the roseate spoonbill, you'll notice that he's rose-colored and has a bill shaped like a wooden spoon. There's also the blue-footed booby, who probably got his name from Spanish sailors calling him Bobo, or stupid, because he walks like this. For most people, that's a good enough reason to name a bird. Meanwhile, at the Royal Society. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I present to you the resplendent Quetzal. You are a bunch of mostly aristocratic gentlemen who have decided to devote your lives to the study of exotic birds. Why? Well, because it's the 1800s. The Industrial Revolution was beginning to provide unprecedented gains in economic productivity. Real wages were up, amount of hours worked were down, and the idea of leisure time became something that was not only available to the royal family, it also opened up for the top 5 to 10 percent. Now those people had more free time to pursue hobbies, like racquetball, walking the boulevard, going to the opera, and of course ornithology, from the ancient Greek ornis, meaning bird, bird studies. You might fill out an entire room full of taxidermy dead birds to prove to your rich friends that you were learned and that you knew much about the world. Like this bird, the file stork. This stork was found alive in Germany with an arrow in its neck. It was shot somewhere in Africa, somehow miraculously survived, and then migrated thousands of miles all the way to Germany, only to be shot by a German scientist. Scientists then use this as proof that birds do in fact migrate. Because before this evidence, a lot of people literally thought that birds hibernated in the winter, or even magically turned themselves into mice. In the Middle Ages, on the wild coast of Scotland, narwhal horns from the Arctic Circle would wash up on the beach, and people back then, not knowing what they were, fantasized that they were the horns of the mythical unicorn. Oh yeah, unicorn, I swear to you I saw one once. To this day, the unicorn is still the national animal of Scotland. Meanwhile, a failed Scottish poet decided to emigrate from his native home. He landed on the shores of the United States in 1794 and created the first catalog of American birds. Using his bad poetry skills, he named such birds as the fish crow and the green black capped flycatcher. But this uncovered a major problem. The same bird might have dozens of different names depending on what region you went to. The American woodcock is sometimes described as a timber doodle, a mud bat, a bog sucker, a night partridge, and a Labrador twister, amongst many others. This problem got solved by the most important scientist that you've probably never heard of, Carl Linnaeus. He is the reason that every animal in the entire world has a double-barreled Latin name, like Panthera leo, or Felis catus. Linnaeus believed that nature was a great book that God had created, and that every name he came up with was another word in that book. He coined thousands of Latin animal names, believing that he himself could name every single animal on planet Earth. Today, we know that there are over 400,000 different species of beetles alone, to say nothing of the millions of species in the Amazon and deep under the oceans that we haven't even discovered. There must be about eh, 10,000 species, said Linnaeus. Turns out there's probably more than 10 million, and we don't even know half of them. But the foundation that Linnaeus built gave a framework for any scientist in any country in the world to be able to communicate about the exact same animal. In the 1800s, European countries massively expanded into the colonies. Any aristocrat could, in theory, pick up a shotgun, go out into the forest, and come back proclaiming themselves a naturalist. Having named a strange tropical bird that they saw, the blue-shoed tralalero tralala. 
A good example of this was the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Even as a child, he was a naturalist. In 1867, when he was eight years old, the young president acquired a severed seal head that had washed up on the shores of New York Harbor. It inspired him to personally collect more specimens and create the Roosevelt Museum of Natural History. Roosevelt made hundreds of doodles of birds he saw in his field journal. In his PBS biography, they said that the following year, having obtained spectacles to correct his vision and a shotgun to aid in capturing specimens, Theodore traveled with his family to Egypt and Syria, where he collected numerous birds. By then a skilled taxidermist, he skinned and mounted the birds himself. If young Roosevelt's collection methods seemed bloody and cruel, he merely followed the accepted practices of the leading naturalists of the day. Killing was the only way to make extremely accurate observations about the physical characteristics of completely unfamiliar animals. Birds held a special place in the heart of every 19th century naturalist, in part because they were everywhere and easy to capture. And on the other hand, simply because they were beautiful and striking to look at. So striking that Victorian people used their feathers as the most stylish fashion of their era. For a while, even entire taxidermied birds were sewn into the hats of wealthy ladies. One auction house in London recorded in a single sale the plume feathers of over 192,000 herons that had been shot, killed, and delivered, just so people could put them on their hats. It got so bad that entire species were completely disappearing. In 1750, the top naturalists of the day, like Carl Linnaeus, didn't even believe that animal extinction was something that was possible. The prevailing belief was that if God created a perfect world, all animals were present at the creation and continued to be present. To paraphrase Thomas Jefferson, God never would have made an animal so weak as to go extinct. When people dug up fossilized mammoth remains, their first thought was not, oh, this is a fossilized extinct species. Their first thought was, how did this weird looking elephant get so far up north? When Jefferson dispatched Lewis and Clark to explore the American West, he also instructed them to keep an eye out if they saw any mammoths. Suffice it to say, there were basically no protections at all to prevent animals from going extinct. President Roosevelt visited Pelican Island, Florida in 1903 and witnessed just how badly the heron populations had been decimated by hat hunting. He decided there to create America's first national wildlife refuge. It was in this environment that naturalists were going on two-year expeditions deep into the jungles of the tropics, searching for more and more exotic bird species that would dazzle and impress the public. The secretary bird was named because it looked like a 19th century secretary with pens behind her ear. The great go-away bird was named for obvious reasons. One 22-year-old naturalist, on his own years-long expedition, studied the blue-footed booby. His name? Charles Darwin. Darwin discovered a set of finches on the different islands of the Galapagos that each had small differences, like bigger or smaller beaks. Upon returning to England and studying them more closely, Darwin realized that these were actually different species that evolved over millions of years from a single common ancestor. God created the world and all the animals in it, so said thousands of years of Christian teaching, until Charles Darwin realized that these finches evolved to fit different environments. He called this process natural selection. For example, the large ground finch evolved a huge beak with which it can crack open the shells of nuts, while the vampire finch evolved a sharp beak to peck at the skin of blue-footed boobies and parasitically feed upon their blood. Maybe AI starts giving us more free time, just like the steam engine gave Darwin free time. And then all of us will find our own ways to spend that time, cataloging the world in ways that use our creativity. We shouldn't take our bird sanctuaries and our hobbies for granted. 
For a while, some of the greatest minds were devoted to naming and understanding something as humble as a booby. But for now, we'll just leave you with a slideshow of fantastic birds. Молодец. Умничка, умничка.